board for anybody. Not able to be here. All right, so let me just start by saying good morning, happy Friday, welcome. I hope that your school years are starting off well. I hope things are going well. I know a lot of things are probably underway already. Um, so hopefully everything is just going according to plan. I'm so excited that we're actually still in school and nothing, you know, knock on all of the wood, nothing gets disrupted and we get to continue this for the whole school year. Um, so today's community of practice is gonna be on um, leadership team meetings and what to do within a literacy team meeting. So this was kind of, I talked about this during, um, and let me stop for a second. Shannon, did you want to hop on real quick before I get started and say anything? Yes, I just wanted to jump on real quick and say good morning. I'm Shannon Bieber, Executive Director of Literacy here at the department, and wanted to jump in and say um, real quick, just I hope you all have a great year, and I'm looking forward to um, seeing the results of these innovations. So y'all have, um, have a great, unique opportunity in becoming like schools that are going to serve as models for the rest of the state. And so I just want to say thank you. I know that these innovations are different. That's why they're called the word innovation. And so it's not something that we've typically done before, but there is some good research behind these innovations. And so we look forward to um, doing some school visits this year with you and seeing these innovations in work. And so that, as I said, you become those great models as we push this out um, to more schools um, through the grant next year, but even um, potentially throughout the state as we can show that these innovations are working. So just wanted to jump in and say, have a great year doing so. And I look forward to um, jumping on these communities of practice with you in the future and come and visit some schools. So y'all have a great year. Thanks, Shanna. Okay, so jumping in, I kind of shared this in the office hours, and those are not mandatory. You know, these are just your opportunity to ask any questions that you have. So I'm not going to just stay here, but just real quick, these are some things that we've done through years one and two. So you made site based literacy teams, you created goals for literacy for your systems, um, you picked a signature innovation, you became the literacy innovation coordinator, and you identified a QOZ community partner. And so looking forward into this year, we're starting year three, we're going to continue to implement and track your signature innovation. We're going to continue to meet in your site-based literacy teams with your QOZ partner. And you're going to start to consider what site or what grade band would you like to expand or transfer your innovation to. So we have two outcomes today. Um, the first one is that you're going to be able to determine how you will track the progress of, of your signature innovation if you don't already know. Um, and then you're going to construct or think about how to construct a long range plan for your site based literacy team meetings that you're having. And just so you can kind of see, you know, um, long range plans are something that kind of just keeps us on track. It gives us a vision for where we're gonna go. And so we're not just trying to hodgepodge and pick something new just to have a meeting. So I just wanted to share with you all, um, this is kind of our long range plan together. And just like you're about to learn in a second, this is definitely a living document. So this is definitely something that can change as our needs change together as a community. But this week we're diving, or this month, we're diving into those long range plans. Next month, I was gonna take you through examples of agendas and outcomes um, for your literacy team meetings. Then we were gonna dive into your schedules as the literacy innovation coordinator, data used to track progress of the innovation, making the most of your time as a literacy innovation coordinator, um, the hexagon analysis tool to determine effectiveness of the innovation, and then scaling the innovation to another grade band. We're gonna start talking about that. But like I said, these are subject to change. So what, I'm, what I mean when I say that is, say in November, three of you have come to me and said, Natalie, I really need support in this. Our data is showing this. This might change because there might be a new need that arises and I have to be willing and open to that so that I can service your needs. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay. And like I said, this is just our guide. All right, let's jump back into the presentation. Okay, so our agenda is that we've already gone over our outcomes. We're gonna review some key criteria for your innovation, and we're gonna discuss and analyze things to consider for innovations. So um, analyze criteria for creating that long range plan. And then I have an example long range plan I'm gonna show you. And I'm hoping we have about 10 minutes left for y'all just to collaborate, share what you're doing, ask questions of each other, ask questions for me, and then um, a closure. 
So these are just some reminders about the pre-teaching innovation if you've chosen the pre-teaching innovation. And this is everybody except for EBR. So um, just that justification when, when intervening after a lesson, the student has already struggled and feels defeated. So the innovation is intended to prevent that from happening. And it's especially effective for L's and students with exceptionalities or disabilities. So this is why, you know, as a UIN school, every school at, that's a part of this grant right now um, actually has the distinction, the label for students with disabilities, except for one school. So um, this is gonna serve well for most of you. Literacy plan details. So in your literacy plan, these are some things that the grant specifies should be a part of that. And if you need me to send you the little one pager with this, I'm happy to do that as well. And I'll be sharing this presentation with you. EBR, this is you guys. Mm -hmm. So just some reminders about the family engagement innovation. And I've talked to y'all about this. Mm -hmm. Again, if y'all need me to go through that over with you, I'm happy, happy to do that. Okay. So site-based literacy teams, y'all have developed site-based literacy teams. And so we're just looking at that. You have a, a district-wide one and then you have a site-based one at your schools that you're servicing. And so we're just looking at the purpose of them going forward and how can we just continue to maximize those. So the purpose of these teams is to collaborate with peers and key players to determine if these literacy innovations are effective, determine next steps and monitor progress of the signature innovations. Um, they can happen inside of an existing structure. So if you already have an existing structure, like an ILT meeting or an instructional leadership team meeting, this can just become a part of that. We don't need to have a whole separate meeting um, for your literacy team. It can kind of coexist already in there. If you don't, and the states kind of go into best practices, going to these NIET structures for ILTs. So if you don't have that, then we want to think about just having that special place for literacy. But if you do, don't recreate the wheel. It fits perfect in there, okay? It's recommended that liter literacy teams meet weekly, okay? But a minimum of, of every other week or twice a month, because you want you don't wanna keep going week after week after week doing the innovations and not looking at progress to see who's growing, who's not, what's happening with it. The QOZ partner is only required to attend monthly though. We, the, these people's time, they've agreed to be a community partner. They've agreed to team with you and you're in your school. And we're so appreciative of that, but we need to be respectful of their time. And so placing them at that monthly, decide what monthly time you want them to come to that meeting and place them either at the beginning or the end. I feel like it works best at the beginning because the purpose of them being there is to share what's happening with your growth or, or maybe it's not growth and you can tell them these are what some things that you have planned as next steps. But then that becomes a person in the community that can go out and say, so-and-so elementary or so-and-so middle school are really doing all these things to invest in our kids here. And their, and their literacy. Um, so they become kind of a team member and they're invested. Considerations for taking these site-based literacy teams a step further um, is, this is just like going forward throughout the year or maybe even into next year, just consider inviting a higher education partner. A lot of the universities are trying to be very um, vocal and partnering with us to really help their teacher prep programs be prepared with the science of reading, to have these educators coming into the classrooms prepared for the needs that we have right now in literacy across the state. So a lot of them are very eager to partner. And so that's a great extra expert that you can add to your literacy team. And again, that can be that once a month one that the QOZ partner pops into. Consider if you don't already have one, adding a parent or even where appropriate a student. We don't, of course, want a kindergartner in our meeting, but maybe you have a middle school and you want them just to get more input on the practices that are happening on your campus. And if y'all have any questions throughout or comments or anything, please stop, unmute in the chat, whatever you have, so that I can answer any of those as we go. Okay. So this, today, this morning, we're talking about creating this long range plan, right? As we meet in our literacy teams. And so we need topics for that. And these are just some questions to help you consider um, what, let's see, make sure everybody's muted. Yep. Things to consider for where you might go with topics. Okay, so these are some things to consider for your innovation. How is this helping me achieve my goals in my literacy plan? So you've written some, you've written some goals, and the first session of the School Support Institute is really going to focus on this. It's going to focus on constructing literacy goals. They're going to dive a lot more into that with you. But how is whatever your innovation is doing, how is that helping you get to your literacy goal plans? What overall or summative data are you using um, to track for your innovation? What progress monitoring data is being used? 
when and where will students be pulled or where and when will parents be brought together if you're doing the family engagement innovation? Who was responsible for performing the innovation? And what I mean when I say that is, is it you yourself? Is it paras? Is it a classroom teacher? Is it um, community partners? Who's helping to be a part of this? And then just a few more, what training is needed for staff to perform the innovation? And when or where will the training occur? What materials are needed for the innovation? Have we performed the hexagon analysis to determine the reliability and feasibility of the innovation? Did it come out favorably or do we need to make some adjustments? And what is needed to track the subgroups that are being targeted? So do we need some spreadsheets? Do we have just a old school binder? Like what are we using to kind of track and determine how these subgroups are growing? So let's talk about that first. And I kind of, here's where I wanna start hearing from you either in the chat or out loud, what data or what processes do you currently have in place to track your innovation? Are you an old school binder person? What's in that binder? Yes. Or do you have a spreadsheet or you have a progress, progress monitoring program? Y'all kind of share it with me. What are you using right now to track that? I know Ms. Antoinette said you're using a binder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about everybody else? What are y'all using? We use a, um, a binder and a spreadsheet just, you know, just to have it in two, two different spots. It's easier for us to actually view everything. And we also have some progress monitoring programs in place. Okay, Jordan, can you share a little bit about it with me? Because other people might want to hear too. What are some things in your binder that you're tracking specifically? Um, well, I have their growth to mastery targets for their, you know, their LEAP scores for what they need okay. um, that I share with the teachers. And we discuss the different ways that they need to um, make sure they are front loading and doing the pre-teaching initiative to help them grow towards that goal. Okay. Um, and then, so we have the list of the names, their growth to mastery. Um, if they're EL students, we have their, you know, what level, what their English proficiency is, um, what programs they're in, you know, are they in our success strategies class that focuses on, um, teaching students how to read, or are they in our after-school tutoring program? Are they in both? Um, and if they aren't, what do we need to do? You know, kind of the information about why and how we need to address that throughout the school day. Yeah. So a couple different data points. That's exciting. And y'all are all doing kind of mm -hmm. very, very different. Wait, mm -hmm. So let's see, okay. Latoria's got progress monitoring program. Latoria, what are y'all using for your progress monitoring? We use tables. Devils, good. Mm -hmm. um, we're also like Jordan. Um, we have a data binder for teachers that um, has multiple uh, data trackers in it. And mm -hmm. so um, we have for our core, we have like, for example, three through five, they use their sex section diagnostics, um, of course, to do some, some pre-teaching planning. Mm -hmm. And then um, we have other other diagnostics or assess, uh, formative assessment data that's in that binder, um, as well as their, um, we decided to use our um, bit, uh, dibbles through our benchmark test through eighth grade this year. Oh, good. So um, just to get a pulse of where students are at mm -hmm. and to see, do we need to do further assessments um, or screeners for some of those upper grade students that need tier two, tier three interventions. So we also have data trackers for those students that have been identified. Um, and then of course the planners that teachers are using to know what they're doing with those students at those designated times. So we, Brandy, we also you have, have the classroom support. teachers doing it, right? They're the ones doing the innovations for y'all? Yes. Yes, okay. Yes, yeah. So um, I work with the coaches, with our literacy coaches, and then they work directly with the classroom teachers yep. to, to uh, implement those innovations, yeah. Perfect. Thank y'all so much for being brave and sharing. I know I'll be able, I'm of course going to give you the structure and I have information to share with you, but I also know being an instructional coach for five years, we learn best from each other sometimes. So I want y'all to be able to hear from each other and see what's working in your districts to know, to just have some other ideas and see where else to go. Um, and then Stacy shared in the chat and hers is very similar um, to what Jordan was saying in Brandy, you know, just different, multiple different data points. Um, and I can't wait to hear how Spire is going to go because I've heard some really good information from Spire being used in some other districts. So that's exciting. And so what I'm happy to hear is that you all kind of at least have some kind of plan for how you're tracking this. So that's the most important thing with the innovation. Perfect. So 
some criteria for a long range plan. And just like with the literacy plan, there is nothing in the grant that says that you need to give me a certain form. These are just some look fors if you don't have a long range plan already to consider. OK, this is not something that has to be turned into me. This is not a compliance thing. This is really just an idea to keep you on track and to have a roadmap for where you're going. So on the form, I'm going to share you an example, share with you an example of one in just a second. But on the form, just some things to consider the date, the topic for the meeting that week, the objective or the outcome, whatever it is that you call it, and then a follow up from that meeting. That's the most important piece. So you come together, you have these meetings and then you meet again. But what's the, where the rubber meets the road is kind of what's happening in between the week to week to know what's happening with the follow up. OK, the literacy plan is a focal point. A meeting can occur anywhere around any component in the literacy plan. OK, so I have a link to that. And most y'all all have a site based literacy plan already. But this is just the one from um, an example from us that we supply if you need one. And you, this is this again. Your literacy plan is a living document too. So as much as you need to, to tweak and kind of go back, you can. So these are some things that hopefully you already have at this point in the year: a literacy vision and a literacy mission statement. If you don't, feel free to have a, a meeting around that because that's something where a meeting of the minds needs to come together, and we should have a solid vision and mission for that. You should have goals, okay? You should have a student-focused goal, a teacher-focused goal, and a program-focused goal. And I encourage you just being UIN recipients, we have that subgroup focus too. So whatever your subgroup focus is, consider making a, a goal specifically for them. Um, who's on your literacy team? Hopefully we know that already. And we can continue to add to that or take away from that as you see fit. Meeting schedules. And then here's where you really start to figure out what topics you might have a literacy team meeting on. You have guiding questions. This section is around instruction, interventions, and extensions. And so there's two things that you're kind of looking at as you're doing these innovations. Of course, you're tracking the innovation. But part of the reason that subgroup might not be growing, period, or anyway, might be something that's happening or not happening within tier one instruction. So just keeping that lens to see how are things flowing between tier one and that innovation or intervention that you're doing. So asking yourself questions around those to make topics, then you develop your action plan. And then here is another big place to go for topics, ongoing professional growth. So these innovations, especially when it's not you yourself doing the innovation. And I love that y'all have classroom teachers, paras, all these different stakeholders doing it, because as you start to expand the innovation, you're only one person. So if you're the only one with your hands on it, sometimes it's hard to kind of go out and coach and spread that great thing that's happening to other places. So they need to be professionally grown, right? They need training maybe around tier one. They need training on the materials you're using in the innovation. Um, maybe they need training on just even classroom management and how to support small groups. So there's all kinds of different things to consider when you're thinking about your innovation and those subgroups growing. And then lastly, even if your innovation is not family engagement, there's so much that we can do to engage the families to be partners with us to help the progress that we're having or not having with those students with that. So again, a meeting can happen around any one of those things. Topics and objectives are set based on the need on that campus. So I'm gonna give you an example of that in just a second too. And then lastly, I keep saying this, but it's a living document. So the order can change at any time. The needs are fluid. We know that we've seen that, especially in the last three years between COVID hurricanes, all the things, you know, needs are very fluid at different times. And so you can kind of go off script and, and come back to that at, at, a, at a given point. Ooh. All right. Lastly, topics and objectives should follow a natural progression. So sometimes we are like, oh, my gosh, we have all these needs and we just start putting all the most important things. But sometimes you're in these meetings and you feel like yourself, you're going back and forth and back and forth, skipping to between different needs. So when you sit down with you know, your principal or whoever else is on your leadership team, think with them through what's a natural progression of seeing that skill or that deficit going all the way through before you hit something else and you're not jumping around. Data that should be used um, and consulted to determine where the starting point is and where to continue exploring. And my heart is already so happy because you've already named most of these things when you started talking about tracking, but qualitative data, some classroom observations, classroom observations during the innovation and classroom observations during tier one. 
lesson plans, feedback, um, and then quantitative data, whether you're using Dibble's um, A Steep, Acadian's I Steep, LEAP data, high quality instructional material assessments, progress monitoring data, all of these things can be considered for topics for uh, long range plans. There we go. Okay, so let's talk about the process for creating one. You wanna start by looking at your literacy plan. This should really be the focal point for your whole uh, meeting and in the scope of your meetings to decide what your goal is. Are you working towards it? Are you making progress at the rate that you wanna make progress at? If not, why? Consult that data to determine where your starting point is. And so I have the example in a second is gonna talk about that too. And then investigate to determine why the data shows that trend. So for instance, if you're looking at your BOI data for Dibbles and you're like, oh my gosh, they scored really low on this, kind of start to investigate about why that might be for those particular kids. Conduct up. So after you have this list of topics and you're saying, okay, I know that they scored poorly because this isn't happening in innovation or they're not progressing here or I have this gap in my tier one where my teachers aren't understanding how to implement that piece correctly. Um, and you have this list of topics. Now it's time to take that list of topics and you do a cause analysis. So which one is the most important? Which one do we need to start with? Um, and then think about what work you would want to be done around those topics you've selected. Start constructing some outcomes for those meetings. And then continue to analyze the effectiveness of your meeting and plan to determine if any changes need to be made along the way. And feel free to do that as you collaborate with your other leadership team members. All right, so here's a scenario. The literacy team at Pelican Elementary has already set goals for this year after looking at the beginning of why BOI, beginning of year Dibbles data, and last year's data trends. They set the following goals. They're saying by the end of 2025 school year, 95% of third graders will read 112 words correct per minute or their individual growth target if it's different. And 95% of students with disabilities will meet their growth target for the 2022-2023 school year as measured by Dibbles data. The beginning of the year Dibbles data indicated that first grade is low in nonsense word fluency or correct letter sounds, scoring only 30%. What other data should the literacy team look at? And so whether you wanna unmute or put in the chat, what are some other pieces of data they should look at besides just this Dibbles data to see what's going on or why? I, um. I would want to look at how they're scoring on the state assessment and how they're scoring on um, maybe the major the major assessments within the tier one class mm -hmm. to see if there's an, um, some correlation there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most definitely. So if this is the first grade, so we might not have like elite data, but we definitely would have like you're saying that high quality instructional material data, the assessments, you know, that you're looking at within the curriculum. What else, Brandy? Um, I would also say any other screeners to take it a step further to say, okay, I know that this percentage of students are not on grade level in this particular measure. Mm -hmm. um, now let's dig into that to see, take it a, a, take a deeper look to see what within that is holding, you know, is, is students need to, to uh, have opportunity of growth in. Yeah, little, you know, um, root cause analysis kind of thing, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't yeah. know how many of y'all know about all of the, um, the resources that are out right now, but Lyft, our Lyft diagnostic, if you don't already have something that has that diagnostic tool after you give the screener, kind of digs lower to see, is it a fluency is issue? Is it, um, you know, is it letter sounds? Where is where is the breakdown happening? Stacy said classroom work and classroom curriculum assessments, most definitely. Anybody else? Okay, so what other questions should be asked? Besides just this data that's happening, what other questions should the leadership team kind of start to ask themselves? Are you as the innovation coordinator? What are some other questions you should start to ask yourself? I, I think I think we need to ask is what intervention are you also using okay. uh, to help with this? So what inter I'm, look, 
intervention. I know we're looking at first grade and low and nonsense word fluency. Mm -hmm. And I know now, even though I, we are not using it as much, uh, but the lift, are you doing, what are you doing for that uh, subgroup population? Mm -hmm. If Is it how you're identifying them? Um, so I, I think it's a lot of little things that you can do identifying the population uh, because it might not be all of the first grade students, but it might be some of them. Uh, and just what remediation or intervention are you using for them? You hit it on a good thing too, Dr. Jordan. One thing is this is showing full, like whole, whole first grade at the school, right? And so one thing, we want to look at all those people as a leadership team and in, in literacy team meetings, like those, all those kids are important. And then for the purposes, not just of this grant, but just period, looking at that subgroup too. So you said something important. You said pulling data to determine like what's even happening with those subgroup kids, right? The students with disabilities, are they not growing at the same rate or is it even worse maybe like what's happening there? What's happening during the innovation time in different classrooms if it's not you? Um, what else? Yeah, another thing, um, a, a starting point that I always like to look at with our students with disabilities um, is when are these students being serviced? Because, you know, if they're being pulled out of, pulled out of their core time, yes. they're not getting that grade level instruction. And so um, one of our starting points when we are looking at students with disabilities, just because of the history mm -hmm. of when students were, were serviced in the past, um, not talking about any other districts, but just a known history for, for Point Capee is that we had to break away from pulling students out of core time. Um, and so I would start with, are they, are they receiving their core instruction? Um, you know, when are they receiving those, those services and how can we um, bring in that team for that student to support the student in, in their, their growth journey? Most definitely. Most definitely. Y'all are asking great questions. And Stacey's put in the chat, like, what are previous scores or performance for those students? So maybe looking back at that kindergarten data to determine, like, how are they, you know, what's ha what's happening? Is it learning loss over the summer? Is it just they've been low? Like, what's happening there? Um, and then when and what is happening and who is providing it? So, like, all of those things. Um, and then I want to give y'all some time to definitely collaborate. So instead of just sharing out how could this map out, I'm gonna show you just an example I came up with um, for potentially how this could look. Um, let me move my bars in the way. Or how this could look in a long range plan. And I'm gonna share this with you guys too, okay? So this is just like a potential one, all right? So like I said at the beginning, we have our date, we have our topic, we have an objective, like what should happen by the end of that meeting. The follow-up shouldn't come up, we shouldn't come up with that until that meeting has already taken place. But I've just given you this box kind of filled out so you could see what it could look like. And then any, any notes. So if that was my example, the first thing, and y'all already said this, the first thing I wanna do is a data dive to determine how the subgroup is even doing on the screener. Okay, so my objective, by the end of this literacy and team meeting, members will identify trends in the BOI Dibbles data for students with disabilities and identify any areas or students of specific concern. So maybe I noticed that the majority of the students with disabilities are still scoring 30% like everybody else, but these, there's two kids that are like at 2%, like we are, they're really red stars. So I have a plan for them. My follow-up from that meeting could be that walkthroughs are happening during the innovation time just to get data on how's the delivery looking of the pre-teaching and what are some student responses. So you can kind of just see what that looks like. Then the next week, I'm thinking we're going to go through that walkthrough data to find trends, to find next steps. And then I have an objective there by what I want people in the meeting to pull out of that. Then I'm going to go into evaluating the alignment between the materials for the innovation and the tier one curriculum. Sometimes we we always want what's best for our kiddos, but sometimes we're looking at all these different programs. All these programs sometimes sound fantastic, but sometimes even though two programs are great, they're not speaking to each other. They're teaching things in a different way. And it's so it's really important that everything we're choosing is aligned as possible that it's grounded in the, in the science of reading research so that we can see those, those things happening. They're not counterproductive to each other, right? And we have an objective for that. Then we can go through the walkthrough data of those whole group lessons. Because again, there is a breakdown sometimes of you know, how those students sometimes, and not all the time, end up in special education services, right? And then maybe a design and a plan, a schedule for further professional learning of those innovation materials. Maybe as I was going through all this, I learned, oh goodness, 
we really need some more training on how to do the chaining or how to do whatever it is that the kids needed in the innovation or in that tier one time in that in that core instruction time. Okay, so before I kind of release you to kind of start collaborating and sharing out, um, is there any questions specifically about just the sample long range plan? Feel good about that. And then I had more than one of you that kind of just came to me and said, Natalie, like, what could this look like in literacy team meetings? So I definitely wanted to make sure I addressed that was a great question. Like, this is really where you're one person. So we need like the whole village with you doing the work. And y'all are so lucky to have people with you that are supporting you. You know, your principals have chosen, the district's chosen you to be a part of this. And so making sure we're all working together is going to be the best way to move it forward. And so I want to make sure this is such a big piece of the work that you're doing is to have this plan in place and to have help them be a part of it, you know, your leadership teams. So, all right. I'm going to stop sharing. Well, let me give you the last Last little slide. So um, I want you just to think through, you're not gonna obviously construct a whole long range plan right now, but I wanna know before you leave me, are you okay with at least coming up with topics? Do you know what data to look like? If you don't, then I want us to schedule time together so that we can go through together and say, okay, this is where I could pull data. This are some topics that I could do. We can talk through that. Um, just want to make sure you're aware of the resources that are kind of the newest ones on the Louisiana Literacy Library, the lift kit, those fire lessons for grades three through five foundations, content literacy support documents for grades three through 12. Um, and then we have some upcoming webinars. I don't know if you've heard about those, but there's one that I'm doing for lift in upper elementary, middle and high school, what it could look like to use lift there. And then Sarah Stolman who is a genius on the science of reading, is doing science of reading and literacy innovation uh, tools for those power professionals and support staff to help us in this really important work. And then just upcoming events, the School Support Institute will kick off September 27th in Monroe and we'll run the rest of that week at our different locations in uh, Shreveport, Lafayette, and New Orleans. And then that's an all day one, nine to three in person. And then every other meeting will be virtually half day. Okay, so you're in person one whole day, virtual half day. Those are just six meetings across the whole entire school year. And then office hours, our next office hours together, which again are just voluntary, is Friday, October 2nd at 11. And our next community of practice will be October 14th at 11 a.m. Okay. So if you have not already done so, please put your first and last name if you are a literacy innovation coordinator in the chat for uh, attendance. And then we have about four minutes left. I just want to give you all the opportunity if you want to ask questions of each other. If you have questions of me, I'm happy to answer any of those. I, I have one question for really just um, anybody. Okay. Um, Okay, when it comes to innovation time and then your tier one curriculum, your teachers that are teaching the tier one curriculum, um, how, how, how does your schedule look as far as how much time you're spending in the innovation class versus the tier one class with the teachers? Or do you have a school where there's like, uh, there, it's inclusion and so there isn't really a separate um, area? So just, just kind of seeing how everyone else is um, handling that situation. Um, we actually broke it down in our master schedule. And so every teacher has 30 minutes prior to core and it's indicated in mass in their master schedule. Um, we, because we're, we're rolling out this innovation, not just with literacy, but also with math, we call it core supports in our district. And so on every teacher's schedule, it says from this time to this time, which is a 30 minute time period, core supports. Um, and then immediately after that, they go into core. And so we have a 30 minute core support time and then a um, 60 minute core instruction. So is but your it, core support kind of like RTI time? No, it's or is it in addition. Okay. It's, it's, so all pre Yeah, it's pre teaching gotcha. designated, 30 minutes designated strictly for that. Um, this year, in addition to that, we did the, we added 15 minutes even prior to core support time for fire lessons for our three through five. So it's laid out in their schedule, um, you know, from 10 o'clock to 10.15, your fire lesson, 
1015 to 1045 core support pre-teaching for ELA, and then um, 1045 to 1145 core core grade level. Yeah, so we um, when we first started doing this, we realized it really has to explicitly state in the schedule what the teacher should be doing. Um, teachers want to do the right thing and they want to do whatever it tells them that they're supposed to be doing during that time, that's what they're gonna be doing. And so we, we um, a couple of years ago when we did not, you know, when we first rolled out core supports, um, we did not have it. And it just said from this time to this time, it, it, in fact, it might've said like CS slash core. So what we found was there was no separation in time and the whole block was used for core time. And I can, I can send you some examples of how that looks on, in our master schedules, if you'd like. Thank you. You're welcome. We have less than a minute. Um, if y'all just need, about to say it's going to kick. Yeah. If we need more collaboration out. time, y'all let me know real quick. I can end the meeting and restart the meeting. Do y'all need, does anybody need that? No. Okay. Well, you will hear from me very soon to set up our in-person meetings, but y'all are total rock stars leading the way in something very new. And I'm so excited for all of you because it really is an important time. Like you see all of the attention that literacy is getting and y'all are part of this work. So um, just kudos to you and thank you for all that you do. Please reach out if you need me before I get to you. Okay. Bye guys. Thank you.